Greenfield. This is Too Many Words, my podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. I have an awesome show in store for you guys today, tomorrow, tonight, early morning, whenever it is that you guys are listening. That's when I have an awesome show for you. I have <clears throat> writer and Stigma Fighter founder um, Sarah Fader on the show here in a little bit. And uh, awesome talk inspiring cool person so tune in be excited it's good stuff how is everybody doing how are you what's going on if you're writing what are you working on are you happy are you frustrated sad encouraged discouraged uh, most days I'm, I would say I am at some point achieve all of those statuses and I'm doing all right doing okay exhausted. I, uh, I'm recording this on a Wednesday and I, a very, uh, Seattle has finally turned its summer weather on. So after a few weeks of just, you know, cloudy, drizzly, kind of chilly weather, it is now bright and sunny and hot and I've been trying to soak it in while I have it and getting the kids out, all getting our vitamin D. So I uh, started the day with a low tide walk with both of my kids and my one dog, Bilbo. Uh, I'm unfortunately not at a spot with my dogs where I can take all three of them out with me and the kids. But it's it's a work in progress, you know, always, always be dog training. Anyway, but yeah, so I did the low tide walk. Um, beautiful. I uh, got nice and toasty under the sun, got my feet wet, kids found some hermit crabs, you know, Bilbo was delighted to splash around in the water and make friends with a Burmese mountain dog, which is now officially on my list of future dogs to acquire as companions. And then we did, you know, the swimming pool, we take the kids to the swim club every day, they have their lessons. And I am on a lounge chair, or at least, you know, if I'm aggressive not aggressive enough to get one, that is. Those are they're a hot commodity. But I'm totally sunbaked and um deadline crazed. I've got a lot in the works and I'm having so much fun writing all of it. Every day. There was a moment there where things were kind of all up in the air. I'm, you know, half nets had come in, other ones were kind of just floating out in the water, and I was kind of, you know, I wasn't living as balanced as I could, so I've been making an effort to be more present in my present, being a little bit more of a contributing member to the household, and not just the weird lady that sits in a corner in the basement writing and talking to herself and into a microphone, and that's been really helping and uh, getting out and doing things and it's just and I feel like saying it out loud I'm kind of like I'm goading fate a little bit and that might sound a little off but it is what it is I do genuinely feel like that um I actually feel like I'm handling things you see by saying that out loud I think I'm I am I'm I'm pushing some sort of cosmic button but anyway I do. I, I've, I've gotten the rhythm. Summer is, it's not like, ah, it's summer. It's okay. We're in summer. We're doing the summer routine. Things are jiving. I'm getting my hands in all these awesome projects and all these different opportunities are opening up and it's a slow paced world. So, you know, gradually things are coming together and I'm starting to see certain things forming and I'm excited and I'm, I'm writing a lot and, uh, and I think that's one thing. There was a couple of weeks that were extra business heavy and I wasn't writing as much as I needed to be. And now I'm, you know, I'm logging tons of words. I've got, um, I'm super, 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 super. All those supers are genuine. I'm super excited for my anthology, the anthology that I'm co-writing with H.M. Jones. Um, meanwhile, in Washington, we just did our first swap. Um, she's going to read the stories I wrote. I'm going to read the ones she wrote. We're going to um, hand them back after, you know, after we, we, we read each other's stuff. And we're going to come up with a plan for the next leg. And it's just working with her is fun. Writing all these weird Washington shorts is fun. It's just, it's good. It's been, a, you know, 
it's been good. And then I'm working on another short for a mag magical realism anthology. And um, and that one's through, that one's published through um, Creative Alchemy uh, Incorporated. So, all good stuff. And, you know, as far as in the full novel world, things are progressing. They are. Um, slowly but surely, but things are progressing. And I should have some cool and awesome and exciting news and updates for you guys within the next, let's say conservatively, a month. But things are moving. They're moving along. And uh, I'm actually kind of upbeat about it. And uh, it's just nice because I just got off a stretch where I was very down about things. And I think part of that is waiting. When you're waiting for something you have no control over, it, you know, it's infuriating. It's, you know, you want something you have no control over when you get it, if you get it, how you get it. You've done your part, and now it's time to wait. And, you know, it's unsettling to wait. At least it is for me. Maybe some people like waiting. I'm not one of those people. But, you know, things are settling in nicely. And I, uh, I don't know. I'm, in, I'm not stress-free. And I don't know if that's my personality or what. But, you know, that's always something I have to combat is my stress levels, how I'm managing myself and my workload and my downtime. I don't like to give myself downtime. You know, I will run multiple days without it. And, you know, mind you, I, you know, I get shoddy sleep as it is. So sometimes I'm a cartoon character and I'm not saying that I'm not. I'm just saying that I'm a cartoon character that feels like they have achieved a level of control I'm just getting used to things, I think. I think that's what it is. And stress is terrible for you. It's so bad. And it's just so, like, you know, I last night I was, <clears throat> I was having trouble focusing, but I was, you know, it was time for me to be heads down and working on this one story. And um, I was having trouble focusing and I was having trouble seeing the next scene. So I jumped ahead a little bit to go backwards and my dog kept barking. So I kept going, and I'm, I don't mean like bark, bark. I mean like ongoing, rumbling bark. And Jake's bark, there's no not hearing it at its, you know, highest decibel. So I go upstairs to see what he's barking at. And, you know, my neighbor's dog is on my yard. And the neighbor is nowhere in sight again. And my dog's barking and barking and barking and barking. Well, you know. This goes on, and I'm just like, I got, to, I got so worked up. And my husband's like, just chill. That is not good for you. And I did chill. And, uh, you know, hunger. And, you know, it stems from all kinds of things, but high stress levels certainly doesn't help. And, you know, I'm much better now, but it is something that I have to work on. My anger, I instantly can just go off the handle and, you know, rage a little bit. And it doesn't feel good. It's not something I'm proud of. You know, and I don't, it especially, you know, that's, that's when I remind myself of my mother the most. And, uh, so, no, anger is no good. And I did, you know, I used to just kind of lose it on people all the time. And I do it a lot less. And even today, there was a moment where I felt like a younger, less mature me would have made the situation more. But I, we were, we are at the pool. It's really hot. There's no shade except for, you know, the sporadic umbrella and there's all these lounge chairs but there's not enough lounge chairs to people and then there's these uncomfortable wooden benches that just bake right into the sun and there's these three women sitting on some a couple of lounge chairs and there was one empty lounge chair right next to her and I went over and I said is somebody using this and she was like oh yes you know and we're just you know me and my friends are talking here so I was like oh all right so I go and I sit on the sun baking uncomfortable bench and I'm watching the kids less lesson and glancing at my phone and answering an email but I keep my eyes keep going back to this you know saved this alleged saved lounge chair nobody is sitting there so after about 15 minutes I get up and I say nobody's sitting in the seat you just didn't want somebody sitting next to you and I picked up the lounge lounge chair lounge chair and I moved it under an umbrella and sat down and read, got some shade, but that was it. She didn't say anything to me. I didn't say anything else to her. 
I didn't, you know, call her disgusting or go off. I just said, hey, you know, I'm going to take this lounge chair. And I don't need to sit next to you. I don't care to. I just want the chair. Maybe I was just hot. Anyway, I think that I am done rambling for now. Oh, wait. Before before we go from, to my talk with Sarah Fader, I just want to remind you that starting next week, um, Too Many Words is just going to be every Thursday. Um, indefinitely. I, I need to cut down to one show to accommodate um, various writing projects. And since I haven't figured out how to clone myself or how to get um, some sort of apparatus that actually extends the time of each day by eight hours, um, we're going to be doing this for a while. But definitely tune in next week because next Thursday I've got um, the best-selling author Richard Cadre on and uh, it's good fun. Thursdays, people. Thursdays. And then after this note, let's, uh, I'll be talking to Sarah Fader. Hey, Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's so exciting to be here. Yay. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been looking forward to talking to you. I, I see all your posts. Your posts always stand out because they're like honest and open and real. And it's, it's nice to see real people on the internet. <laughs> I, I like to be real. I really appreciate that because I think that in the uh, everyday life in the real world, I find that people are often concealing things and trying to hide things about themselves. And it makes it difficult to really have intimate relationships with people. And that's why I try to be as transparent as possible so that I can draw towards me people that are also real and then form real bonds with them. That's awesome. Well, and I agree. I, I so much of the the world. There's like in so many cases there's this like this artificial film. This you know, people when I see um people such as yourself just openly talking about, you know, real issues, things that you're struggling with and things that you're going up against, I mean, it helps, you know, me personally to feel um, you know, like there's this, you know, Place where I can do that as well. Yeah, I, I think that's great. And I think that it's, you know, I sometimes do this thing when I meet new people. It's like my litmus test to see <laughs> how weird I can get. Like, I'll just say like the weirdest shit possible and see what they react to. Um, and, you know, I, I see, I just kind of like gauge how, how strange I can be and how, how like, how open I can be with them, you know? Totally. Well, like my, my go-to um, thing in um, any new social situation, because I mean, I've, I've, I have social anxiety. I really don't feel comfortable around people. Podcasting is different for some reason. Um, you know, there's, it just is, but like out, out in the world, my go-to thing is this, you know, um, random media references. And it's like, okay, well, if you pick, and it's, I don't even do it on purpose, but it's like when somebody picks up one of my like odd little jokes and we can start talking about it, it's like, oh, okay, I'm comfortable now. <laughs> yeah, that, I, I can see that too. I mean, it's, if, if, uh, I don't, I feel like a lot of that stuff, like, I mean, I instantly will connect, for example, with people that like Buffy, you know, yeah, it's, it's like a commonality and like, I feel like that's like my kind of person. Yeah, you know? totally. I love Buffy. So good. It's I, I don't understand people that don't. <laughs> no, <laughs> me. I don't like, either. How do you not like it? What? What's wrong with you? Well, I remember watching it when I was younger too, and Buffy was just like, you know, she just kicked so much ass in so many different ways. And it's like, yeah, I'm going to do that too. <laughs> yeah, and also like, I feel like there's a Buffy episode that relates to every part of life. Yeah, that, yes. <laughs> totally. <laughs> like when her mom dies, uh -huh. or like, you know, going through a really bad breakup or having somebody cheat on you. Like there, it's just everything. There's something for every part of your life. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and they just, they really pushed boundaries on that show. I feel like it's so, I mean, I got, I remember like I got my dad into it. And so, and he's very picky, you know, but, uh, yeah, I just, I just feel, um, I mean, I, I also relate to the, the social anxiety thing because I have a hard time. I really, I do like public speaking, like that's because I come from a theater background, but I don't like to go to 
big parties and things like that. And my technique when I go to those things is I focus on one person. Mm -hmm. No, I have to do that too. Otherwise, I mean, and and crowds too. I mean, I I get, I, I can get pretty easily overwhelmed in certain situations. So yeah, having like, being able to have like that, you know, back and forth with one person, it's, it's a, it's a good way to kind of trudge through the more overwhelming social situations. Yeah, exactly. I, I think I also rely on animals a lot. Like if I go to someone's house and there's a party and I, I, I'll, if I know that there are cats there, I'll like look for the cats, you know? Yeah. Because I'm like, Oh, cause you know, like animals are so non-judgmental and like, you know, and I love cats and I, or, or dogs, like whatever. I really, I prefer cats, but I will, I will like relate to any animal. And, um, and I just feel like, I don't know. I, I, I mean, when I was younger too, it was difficult because I would have to like fabricate excuses why I couldn't go out, you know? And now I'm just like, I'm not feeling it. <laughs> you know? I just will be like, I'm just not going. And then, and I don't feel like I have to explain it anymore. Yeah. You know? But like, and well also, you know, kids too, having kids makes it a lot easier to like, to not do things. Oh, you like. Well, I can't because I, you know, my kids can't go or something, you know, or like they have to go to sleep. Or totally. Yeah. It's the kids. Yeah. I've I've got two myself. So, but I mean, it's kind of bullshit though, because in a way, because like my kids never sleep. So (laughs) like they, they're always awake watching Minecraft. How old, how old are yours? Five and eight. Oh, okay. Um, six and eight. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's it's fun, right? But it's like exhausting. It's it is. I mean, I'm really happy to be like I'm enjoying the elementary spot where as far as we have more independence, we can have all these cool conversations are starting um, out of the I didn't do the baby toddler thing. Well, I, I feel like <laughs> I feel like I'm doing this a little bit better. Uh, but uh, yeah, it is. It's, it's, babies are fucking hard. <laughs> like, it's, I, I just feel like like no one like prepares you for how hard it is to have a baby no they're like oh you're not gonna sleep you're like no but that's not all that's gonna happen no like you're gonna lose like your whole social life (laughs) you know know? it's like or it's not that you lose your social life it's just that your your thing your whole everything changes like yeah I mean for me it wasn't so bad because I'm kind of an antisocial person to begin with so but I think what's difficult, what the whole, the hardest part for me with having kids was like making mom friends. Oh yeah, I don't, I haven't really figured that one out yet either. <laughs> it's just hard because like I just hate people, <laughs> you know. And and it, I mean not real. And it's not that I hate them. It's that like I feel like I don't know. Like I just feel like consistently misunderstood, or like I can't be weird, or you know, I don't know. It's I just have a lot of anxiety surrounding. I'm right there with you. And I mean, I feel, I feel, I mean, it's, uh, it's weird because first of all, I can't, you know, when you're in a situation with other parents, you have the common thing to talk about, which is your kids. But it's like, there's so many conversations that end up like going on with me or around me. And I'm like, I don't, are we just comparing each other based on what we do with our kids? Like sometimes it just feels like that to me. It's like, you know, kind of like tit for tat, like, Oh, well, my child's doing this. And it doesn't feel genuine. A lot of the times. I don't know if that's. Yeah. And and also, I I also feel like it's, it's almost like you're forced into the the competitive dynamic. Like you, you're like, I guess I have to talk about milestones and shit. Yeah. And you know, it's like, you don't really want to do it, but then you're like, what else are we going to fucking talk about? You know, know, I remember like, you know, being hanging out as my, my son was like a baby with other parents and be like, yeah, he's not crawling and feeling weird. And then the, just like the pressure of like, also because boys do everything later than girls. Yeah. So like you'll be on the playground and a little girl is like speaking complete sentences and your, your son is like, you know, da da. And you're like, fuck my life, you know, cause you, you just like, it feels like you're not, your son is never going to do anything. I feel like gr- girls are just so fast to do everything. Yeah. You know? And, um, but yeah, the, comp- the competition thing bugs me. I think probably because I have this inherent competitiveness in me anyway, yeah, you know, I'm always comparing myself to people, you know, or like, 
it's not that I want to be competitive. Like I, I love when my friends succeed and stuff like that, but I think that it's kind of natural sometimes to, to have this like little competitive thing in you, you know? Oh, definitely. And I, I myself, I'm also very competitive and you know, I was thinking, I was actually writing an article about, um, competitive parenting and, uh, you know, during that, I was realizing that like it was getting to me at all because, you know, it was igniting this competitiveness in me. And it's like, well, I just, you know, and it was making me uncomfortable. But it's like at the same time, it's like that's why it was getting to me in the first place, because it's like, well, who are you to say that? Because, you know, my shit over here is, you know, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, um I, I don't know. It's it's really hard. I, I think also like I've gotten into things where he, my friend my friends who have kids even don't understand like my they don't understand my um my parenting decisions or they think that you know they would do things differently and then you and then it's frustrating because like then you start to second guess yourself and you're like well am I fucking everything up or I'm not disciplining them you know strictly enough or whatever and. I don't know. I mean, and then everyone has their own advice and they're like, you know, I think my biggest thing, my biggest struggle is disorganization. Like in the mornings, like we're always late. Yeah. You know? And um, so I try to, I, I do ask advice from other people and as to how not to be late. I think we've tried the whole, it's like, I think that the, the issue for me is because I have ADHD, like, because I have ADHD, I'm inherently disorganized. And so my concept of time really sucks. And, but that's really difficult for kids because they need a schedule. Yeah. You know? So I try to like have some formulation of a schedule, but it really is a lot of times like I'm very easily distracted or, you know, I'm like looking for my keys for 15 minutes before we leave in the morning. So I think that it can be, it can be challenging. It can be. Maintaining schedules for me is like, it's a, it's a constant point that I need to work on. And it's a constant source of stress. And like, I don't have, um, I don't have the best concept of time either. So like when I go ahead and I like plan, like my schedule of like work things I'm going to do during the day around this kid thing and that it's like more times than not the items that I put in, like everything, it just took, <laughs> there was no way that I was going to get all of that in, but it's like my concept of that is just off. So like, and that way too, I kind of, you know, I make myself feel like I'm not, you know, doing what I need to do. But in reality, my expectations of it are like, you know, all out of whack. Yeah, I have that. I have that also. I feel like I have these like unrealistic expectations. Well, because my concept of time is horrible. Or not, I wouldn't say horrible, but because it's distorted. I have an unrealistic expectation of what I can get done <laughs> and, in, and in what amount of time. Yeah. Right? I can write this article in like 20 minutes. No, you fucking can't. <laughs> but like, no, <laughs> you know, you can, you can write it. It's going to be really bad though. Like, <laughs> and, and the thing is that, you know, I think that I sometimes live in a fantasy land with time because I don't want, I, I don't like, I, I I have a very resistant personality towards like rules. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, that's why I did so poorly in corporate America because I was just very resistant to rules and um, I'm a creative person. So that's, that's why like, I saw this funny, there's like a funny like picture online. I can't remember, but it was, it kind of looked like the Salvador Dali clock with like the, the like, numbers melting off and it was like one two three whatever you know and on the clock and so that's how I feel about time I just like it's it doesn't I'm just like oh whatever fuck it I'll get it done whatever you know yeah well you know as far as time too I mean it would be nice like think about what if there was no time like you could just you had like endless you know, I guess you would need sleep and all that. But as far as like, you know, there's morning and night and all that. Like, I like the idea of just having like a blank slate and being able to kind of construct this. Maybe that's a story idea. I don't know. Like, yeah, that's cool. Time, right. time like bending. You get it done when you get it done. Right? Yeah. It happens. Well, it's very, it's very arbitrary, you know, the whole thing. It's not like, you know, 
I don't feel like, I feel like it's not. I mean, I feel like schedules and time are constructed in our society so that things get done. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that, but it, but then it's like you get into a whole political argument. It's like, oh yeah, well, it's that. it happens. It's it's for the purpose of capitalism or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. I I just feel like I think that the the pushback that I have against schedules is that I I feel like it makes me it's it feels so boring to me. Yeah. But then there are so many things that I do that are really boring anyway. Like I have the same fucking thing for breakfast every day. You know what I mean? So like, <laughs> it's not like. I don't know. Maybe it also, but I've also read that doing having a schedule eases anxiety. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, and I can see that too. And I think there's even times where, like, if I am able to realistically put one together, like, there's some days where I'm like, oh yeah, like I hit all of these and I feel good about it. Um, but at the other time, like the the lack of schedule, uh, yeah. Sometimes, like, yeah, I will have anxiety about having to put a schedule together, if that makes sense. I, I get that. I, I know. that. Well, my executive functioning is, like, non-existent. So I, it, it's really hard. Someone's like, just write a schedule. Just make a list. And I'm like, I, I don't, I know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I'll just, I don't know what to do with that. Like, I, I will make, because it's it really is an ADHD thing. Like, I'll sit down and be like, number one on the list is make a list <laughs> or, or I don't even know. I think or, or I, I think I, it has to be more detailed than it actually is. You know, yeah. like it, somebody was telling me the best, the best thing to do is like have three things that you have, you must get done that day. Just three things, just three, just three, because it's, it feels less overwhelming. And then once you, you know, like once you complete item number one, you just move to number two and then, and, but have like three realistic goals for what you want to accomplish that day. I'm going to try that. Yeah. I, and I, it feel, it, it does, when I have done it, it does work. Yeah. That sounds interesting. Yeah. Cause as you say that I'm glancing at my, one of my notebooks is open on my desk and there's this two page, like scribble list with like arrows pointing and little notes. And it's like, yeah, that, it's not going to work for me much longer. But you could also have like a map, you know, a list of things that eventually you want to get done. And then you can pull those things and put them, uh, put them, put three of them on the three list. Definitely. Well, I do. I need to get stuff out of my head. If it's like, especially like, it's like, okay, I've had that thought like three times now. I need to get that down on paper so it stops plaguing me. And that could be an idea or that could just be, um, I need to pay this bill tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, you know, and and I have my my friends who are like more financially responsible are always like, you need to do an Excel spreadsheet. I'm like, I'm gonna be an adult. <laughs> I'm, so I'm so bad at that. I I really, I mean, but I I know that these are the things that I would help me, right? Like they would be beneficial to my life, but I'm so resistant to them. I don't know what it is. I think because it's not that I don't. I don't know. It's not, I, I mean, obviously like I am an adult, but I feel in some ways like it's going to change me or make me less creative to do responsible things. Maybe I don't know. Really, but I mean, I know that's not really logical. Well, you know what? I got to say on that, like hearing you say that there are some days where it's like, I have this like little side list where it's like, I have to pay a couple bills and like yeah. do an errand or something. But then like, you know, my main list of, you know, whatever writing things that podcasting related things I need to do that day. And it's like, I'll glance at that other, you know, household chore list, let's call it. And it's right. like, I look at that. It's like, well, that's gonna, that's gonna mess with what I want to work on. It's going to distract me or that's, you know, there's, I can't do any of those things and get in a creative mood afterwards. So it's yes. like, so there is some of that where I'm like, I don't want to do that because that's not going to help me with this stuff. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Totally. The resistance. Yeah. The resistance. Yep. Yep. Um, so I got to say, Stigma Fighters is so inspiring. And I'm, I'm really curious as to how all of that got started. Um, so I guess I'm trying to think, but, well, when I was, I'm trying to, there's a, there's a couple places I could start with, with that. Um, 
Well, I mean, I've had, I've lived with depression and panic disorder since I was an adolescent, since I was 15 years old. And I had my first panic attack at 15. And um, I, you know, I started blogging, not about mental illness. I started blogging about parenting in 2009 because I wanted a way to document my life as, as a parent. And then I eventually got on the Huffington Post when I wrote an unrelated post about my son loving my little pony. Mm -hmm. And once I had the, that audience, I, I wanted to focus on something that was really important to me. And it was my chance to come out of the closet as somebody who is living with mental illness and panic disorder, because I felt like I really wasn't able to be open with everyone around me about it. Like it, it still felt not like I was ashamed because like I was very open with my mom and you know, my mom was somebody that was very supportive of me during my, when I was dealing with all those issues and, you know, I mean, I've gotten to a point where I am able to manage them pretty independently, but, um, with all, obviously with like a team of professionals, but, um, but I wasn't open with my peers. So, so I, on the, on the Huffington Post, I wrote this article called fighting against the stigma of mental illness. And it, it got very popular and it went, um, it wasn't viral, but it was like, you know, close, like it was very popular. And That's I started awesome. getting emails from people contacting me because of that article, thanking me for sharing my story about living with panic disorder. Cause I came out of the closet and I told them what it was like to live with this and, and how, and also a lot of the misconceptions from living with panic disorder, like that you're lazy or that you're dramatic and you're making it up and you don't really need antidepressants. You know, you should just try to just deal with it. Like, you know, mind over matter and all this shit. So anyway, I had, I got an email from this woman in South America and she said, thank you for sharing your story. I wish there was some place that I could share mine. And so I started looking online to find a place for people to write their stories about living with mental illness and I couldn't find one. So that's when I created Stigma Fighters because I wanted there to be a centralized location where people could just open up and share about living with depression or schizophrenia or PTSD. So I opened it up and I started asking people I knew in the blogging community who I knew were already open with living with bipolar disorder and things, you know, like that to write their stories. So it started with people that I knew. And then I just started asking people on Twitter um, that, you know, Sometimes, sometimes it would just have, they have it in the bio, like bipolar blogger, you know, yeah, or living with schizophrenia. And, um, and then I met my business partner, Ali Burke through, uh, social media, through the mental health community. And she has paranoid schizophrenia. She, she's my vice president of stigma fighters now. So we together, we fundraised and founded the nonprofit organization stigma fighters. So now, uh, we started compiling some of the essays from the site. And we created two volumes of anthologies that are available on Amazon. So they're the Stigma Fighters anthology. So they're thousand word essays from people living with all kinds of mental illnesses. And they're super inspiring. They um, really are. Um, I, I, really, I really love to read the stories because it, it gives me hope about, you know, when I'm going through a really hard time. And I mean, and Allie is really inspirational to me because she, we have a funny joke between us is that her, my anxiety loves her paranoia. <laughs> so so she, we really understand each other. It's a very like yin yang relationship. I'm definitely the yang. She's more like the centered person, you know, um, I'm like the, I'm way crazier than she is. Um, but she has, yeah, she, she's just very dedicated to self-care, a very strong person, despite what she goes through with visual hallucinations. I mean, she's, she's a uh, best-selling author. She works in corporate America. She lives in Los Angeles. Like she's a very successful person and she is my, one of my best friends. Yeah. So we, we have an all female board of directors with the, the nonprofit. Um, and we, I was recently featured in the Washington Post, which was amazing. I saw about. that. That was awesome. Yeah. And, and, uh, and it was great. And so, and with, it was just, it wasn't just me. It was a bunch of mental health advocates, uh, Rachel Griffin, who, 
um, did a musical about the Pope We Have Apples, about living with mental illness. Um, like people that were, were in an inpatient facility talking about their diagnosis. Jennifer Marshall, who runs um, This Is My Brave. That's a, a another nonprofit organization that they produce um, plays about from and, and people like t telling their story about living with mental illness in, in, in a uh, theatrical format. So she's wonderful and she she has bipolar disorder. But yeah, so I, I really have learned so much about different mental illnesses from the advocacy work that I've done with stigma fighters and it has it, it helped me during a time that was very difficult in my life because when I was getting it started and getting the website going, I was going through a separation. So I was separating from my husband at the time. And I was told by my lawyer to not blog on my personal blog about my life because anything, you know, during the custody battle, you know, could be whatever theoretically used against me. Oh you know? man. So I really couldn't talk about my own story. So it was kind of therapeutic for me to have other people share their story. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was a very intense it sounds yeah. yeah i'd imagine and then um and there's two volumes of Stig stigma fighters out correct mm -hmm. um do you plan on a, a third so yeah we're working on the third volume right now we're compiling the essays we also are working with the good men project so we are syndicating so basically like if you write for stigma fighters and you want to have your article featured on the Good Men Project, it will it, it goes there if, if you elect to do that. Okay. I've, I've visited the Good Men Project, but can you tell, tell me a little bit more about it? Like their, their mission is to promote men's health, men's wellness, um, you know, positive images of men and masculinity. Um, and, you know, just, just about like how we can, how, how men can be uh, positive members of society, you know, and um, they are a really, really cool organization. Um, and they, you know, and they talk about a lot of men's issues. I mean, and also, I, I mean, I write for them too. So you, if you're a woman, you can write for the Good Men Project. It just has to, it has to talk about, your articles have to deal with men's issues. I see. Okay. Um, you also write for Psychology Today too, right? Yeah, I have a column on Psychology Today called Panic Life. I, I try to make that column very versatile in the sense that, you know, I, I will, I'll talk about my, my personal issues, but I will also, I want to make it a universal, have a universal appeal. So I will discuss ways that I think, like ways that I think that we, we can, we as people can deal with depression or anxiety. Like I try to open it up and make it more universal too. Very cool. Very cool. You know, so I don't, and I'll, and I mean, I also have random things on there. Like I um, interviewed, I mean like, you know, like I interviewed a veterinarian about um, annoying cat behavior and I, and I oh. love that column. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Well, because I, I like, I mean, I, I, you know, things that interest me. Yeah. You know? And also sometimes I have people guest post on there too. Um, I don't do it like a lot, but I, if I feel like somebody's story is really poignant, I will open up my space to them. Very um, so cool. Now, so is, is writing something that you kind of always wanted to do or, you know, something that you had an interest in or is it kind of something that kind of, became part of your life as so I have I have always I mean ever since I could hold a pencil which was challenging because I had occupational therapy issues that went undiagnosed but um and I never crawled I, I went straight to walking um but yeah I've been writing since I was like literally six years old and, and my mom taught me how to use her old school typewriter like the electric typewriter oh that's awesome so yeah, I, I did. I mean, I we used to write, you know, stories about princesses and stuff like that. And then when we got a Macintosh, like a, like a, the black and white screen Macintosh Plus, and I I co-opted that and started writing on there. And I was just like always writing stories. Like that from, was me. Yeah. Yeah, from a very young age. Like my mom would be like, I think you should go outside. Now. 
<laughs> you know, and I'd be like, no, I'm writing, you know? Yeah. And I was, and I was like, I remember sending as a like eight, nine year old, like sending a short story that I wrote to a pub, like a publishing company. I can't even remember Bantam. I think it was, I sent it to Bantam. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> for consideration to be published. Cause I, cause I had no concept of reality, you know, as a child. Um, and then getting a rejection letter in the mail and I was like, Oh man, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. And then, and, um, and you know, something cool too, like when, when I was in the, uh, third grade, my mom and I, I, I really wanted a pen pal. So my mom used to work as a public relations marketing person. So she said, why don't we start a pen pal club? So we started a pen pal club and she taught me about marketing. We, we, a guy advertised in this, like the Detroit free press, there was an article about this pen pal club. And then we started getting all these letters from kids in Detroit who wanted pen pals. And then it got picked up by this other newspaper. And then we started getting like letters from all over the country. And all of a sudden we had a pen pal. It was really cool. That and then, really cool. and then we, we expanded to like different countries and we had people writing from Africa, like kids from Africa. So like, that was also like another way that, you know, I started writing letters to other kids too. That's really and, uh, cool. It was really cool. But, but yeah, so I, writing has always been a part of me. I think I was a little bit traumatized in high school because I went to a performing arts high school. It was very competitive. You know, the, the, you know, the movie fame. Yeah. Oh yeah. That, that's my, that was my high school. So I, I went for theater, but any, any write any creative writing classes or English classes that I took, you know, everybody was supremely talented and I felt like, how, how can I compare to them? You know, like it, it, it was very, um, ego crushing. And so interesting. I felt, and then I felt the same way. I mean, I always knew that I was a good writer. I, it was something that I was passionate about and that I loved, but that was difficult for me. It made me feel like I was less than, you know? So, yeah. But once it's, but the funny thing is, so, so the healthiest times in my life are times that I, that I have been consistently journaling, right. That I've written every day. When I don't do that, when I don't write, I feel like shit. Uh, yes. So I, it's like, I have to write or I feel disgusting and horrible. Now, when I started blogging, it was the, it was an impetus for me to literally write every day. So I really try if, if possible to write something on my blog every day. Now, recently I was getting trolled a lot. So I decided to start writing a short story instead of writing my thoughts and feelings. But, but I, before that I had been writing like stream of consciousness blog posts, which are very cathartic. They, um, they really are. You know, they're just fun. So I think I might go back to that intermittently when I, when I finish the story that I'm writing. But I try so hard in whatever I'm writing to just say, like, word vomit. Just say whatever it is. Like, don't sugarcoat it. Just say it. Yeah. Because I've worked hard in my life to be like that. Because I, when I was growing up, I was a very shy, introverted child. I mean, it was weird because I I, ha I I was in theater, but I was all, I, like that my then like when I got off the stage, right? I mean, yeah. I, well, as a child, I was introverted. Then then when I went to performing arts high school, so there is this part like when you're playing a character, it's different. You know, when I'm, when you're on stage playing a character, it's like it's not really you. It's like you're the character. But then I come off stage and feel really shy and like self conscious and vulnerable. You know? Yeah. But what I was saying is that I feel like. I, I had this tendency to internalize emotions and not express them. And then I would get really bad um, stomach problems or I would start, I would get health problems if I did not express myself in some way. So I worked really hard to be very transparent in my communication. And if, and the people in my life that are, that cannot handle that level of transparency, I try not to interact with or well, I try to have limited interaction. With. That is a really important thing. I mean, it is, important to you know have relationships and and cultivate relationships I believe that is an important part of you know kind of just what being a human is and it's something that I try to express to my kids that who you you know your your life is a painting and what you put in it it, it you know it it matters so um it, it is important to surround yourself around people that treat you good 
and people yeah. where you feel you like you can be um, you. Which, I mean, I guess, you know, you could argue that you, you know, you should feel like that regardless. But you know what I mean, as far as feeling comfortable and... I, I think that, um, you know, there's... I, I haven't read The Four Agreements, but everyone always is like, read it, read it. Um, but there, the one thing in the in the book, The Four Agreements, that is, you know, that anyone... that I think we can all take from it is, like, not to take things personally, which yeah. is the hardest one. Yeah. Uh, but for me, I think the biggest challenge in my life is that just because someone doesn't agree with me doesn't mean my opinion is wrong. That sounds pretty powerful, actually, thing to... Yeah, I, I mean, because I, I will, you know, like, if, if I feel like I have to convince the person that I'm right, you know? And yeah. And so if they don't agree with me, it doesn't mean that it invalidates my opinion or, like, you know, I, I'm allowed to have an opinion. They are also, in the same space, allowed to have their opinion, and those two things can exist in the same place and I don't have to convince them that it like, like, for example, I mean, it could be something really crazy, right? Like, I, I mean, for, I, I mean, something or something ridiculous, like I, I love cats. And then this other person would be like, I, I, I fucking hate cats. And then I have to sit there and like convince them that cats are great, but that's not, that's not realistic. Yeah. I have trouble. I have these hangups, like as far as like, you know, cars speeding down. I mean, we live, we kind of, we live in a neighborhood that's currently being consumed by Seattle as far as it's not set up to be urban, but it, it's getting more and more populated and houses are coming down and three are going in its place and that kind of deal. And um, it leaves an environment where there is just, it's just zooming all over the place on roads where it's not set up to handle that. So there's no sidewalks yet in some places and that kind of thing. Hmm. So like I get really, you know, just like I'll get I'll get myself bent out of shape after going on a walk with my dogs because of how other people are behaving. But I can just go ahead and, you know, make the choice not to, you know, it's but it's hard. It is. I mean, you have to make a conscious effort. Mm -hmm. And some days I am more successful at that than others as far as letting things roll off my back. Because, it's I mean, I use the car thing as an example. But in general, I'm, you know, I'm kind of, you know, I, I like my stuff a certain way. I mean, that's I, that sounds, I mean, I'm not, <laughs> I like my stuff a certain way. I don't mean it like that. But I mean, as far as like, um, you know, uh, there's a few mothers in the school that my daughter goes to that are very, very, um, I'm going to dress my daughter up in all these different occasions. And my daughter is not like that. And she gets pressure from these girls because of how their moms are putting pressure on them. And that kind of thing just makes me want to like go off. Like I get really angry, especially like if she'll get her feelings hurt because of it, especially if it's coming from one of the parents where it's like, I kind of have to talk to myself and be like, you know what, this is unfortunate. And you can talk to your daughter about it another time, but you need to go ahead and breathe and not just totally lose your temper. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a balance, though, because if, if you don't like something that's going on morally, I think that you have the right to say something, you know? And so I, I feel like it's like maybe they won't understand, you know, or, or whatever it is, but sometimes it's worth speaking up if you disagree with what's happening. I agree with that. I do. I just, I go on stretches and then this was particularly a thing towards the end of the school year where there was just a lot of stuff going on and I was just constantly, I felt like I was just, <laughs> I was the one that kept, you know, waving their hand up and be like, you guys are all screwed up. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I feel, but it, but it's, it's important though, right? Sometimes you have to be like soil and green as people. You yeah. Know? Mm -hmm. Definitely. That's cool. Yeah. You know, you're just like, no, that's fucked up. Sorry. <laughs> but like you said, it's a balance and it's tough. Like it's, you know, I, you know, and I'm, I'm a very passionate person. And when I'm passionate about something, it, you know, it kind of reminded me as, of what you were saying, as far as, you know, people can have their own opinions and you can be right. And the other person can think they're right is, you know, are there certain subjects where it's like, it's so hard for me to get off of them, you know? Oh yeah, no, I have the same thing. I, I, I mean, you know, especially like with the things that are like homophobic or racist, oh. like, I can't talk to you. I'm sorry. No. Well, and <laughs> then I'm right. You know, like, it's, but then I guess for me, like things like that is like those people that are, that are homophobic or racist, they were raised in an environment where that was the norm. Yeah. Well, and so you have to understand that 
it is wrong, right? It's morally wrong, but they don't know that what they're doing is wrong. Yeah. Well, and then, and in that case too, as far as like, you know, creating awareness and it is important to speak up and people are people. Love is love. We don't, we don't, it's one thing you don't need to spread the hate all over the place. Yeah. I mean, I I definitely have had things. My friend just had this, like she was, she was, she was in the Hamptons and, you know, like she's black. And then this, this other person, this white person was like talking about how all black people commit black people commit more crimes and white and she just was like what are you talking about yeah you know i don't know people just don't think sometimes or do they just don't understand how ignorant they are well yeah which it's probably that in itself has got to be a symptom of ignorance right right yeah it's sad it's sad though it is uh, it's just i get you know i get so almost obsessive about it like thinking about that like and it's really hard for me to understand the the lack of kindness in so many of these different situations and the you know and sometimes the news with what the, what they're reporting it's just it's very loud and it's so loud that it you know it's easy all these things to fear and to hate are you know sometimes it's just easier you know it's they're more accessible than you know the beautiful stories or these other things so there is that too as far as like you know contributing to the cycle in that regard so i have a very complicated relationship with the news and the media uh before the existence of social media i did not watch or read the newspaper watch the news or read the newspaper only because i'm a really sensitive person and the majority of the media like it, basically it's either crime corruption or sexual violence. Yes. So Sums it up. I can't, it, it's really difficult for me to read that stuff because it's very, it's triggering and it makes me very angry and sad. Yeah. And it's, and, and then it's even worse to watch it. So I just, so I still, I still do not watch the news because I can't. Um, and I now with that social media exists, um, and the internet is more prevalent, I will selectively read like on, on topics that I, that I am passionate about, you know? Yeah. But I can't really read mainstream news because it makes me angry. No, I'm right there with you as far as, you know, it really gets to me sometimes. And I've been, I go, I've gone on long stretches in the past where I haven't tuned in to, you know, it as a whole I'm in a phase right now where, you know, I am reading the newspaper every morning. I don't watch the news, but I I really reserve TV watching for those shows that I'm obsessed with. Um, yeah. I mean, I wish that I was less sensitive and I could be more tuned into what's happening in the world. Um, and I, and it's not that I, I am, like, selectively ignorant. Like, I do I – will, I will read – I mean, I'm not, and actually, it's funny because – it's this is such a weird thing, but like being on Facebook it, in particular, the people that I'm connected with on Facebook share relevant media articles that then I read. Yeah, you know, and that and I and I consider myself an educated person. Like it's not that I don't, you know, it's not that I that I don't want to know what's happening. It's just that it really it really really triggers me. Oh, definitely. I get that completely. You know, and I and I think, I mean, I've had such bad experiences watching the news where I, then I can't, I have, I can't sleep because I'm thinking about somebody who was sexually assaulted or someone who was murdered, and then I'm just like, I can't, I can't, you know. Yeah. No, totally. Well, yeah, it's it's horrible. <laughs> yes, and, and and also, why is this? In some ways, what what upsets me about those stories is it feels as if that is being. Um, glorified in a lot of ways the way that those certain things are covered it is I mean yeah. and that's what's so upsetting about it it's you know or a lot of not the only thing but some of these horrible acts the way they're talked about it's like you know it's almost like that humanity piece that's just so important is just missing yeah exactly like these people are looked at as like an entertainment value yeah and that, that I think is what my problem is uh, in addition to being triggered by the news is that is that it's like they they're 
It's like, what can we, how can we get as many people to watch this as possible? Well, let's talk about sexual violence because people, you know, are fascinated by it. You know, and you're like, really? But that's fucked up. You yeah. know, like, it's, it's like, you know, I mean, and, and I have a funny connection also, like, I feel kind of like that with Law & Order SVU in a way, um, because even though I find, I like the show and I love Christopher Maloney and I would totally have sex with him, um, <laughs> see if he's hot, um, it, it does feel very sensationalized, you know, like it's, ba- it's also based off real headlines, you know? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. I don't think I knew that. I didn't and see. Prime television shows is something unless it has like a really supernatural coding on it. See, those are the shows that I mean, I like, uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, I can't think of any names, but there's a couple of them that I've tried to watch because I've heard like, you know, oh, they're really good. It's just it's I can't, you know, so much of that. The cases that they follow, it's just it gets in my dreams. Yeah, exactly. It's too much. It's like really it's really um, it's really it can be really upsetting. I, I just I have to watch funny things. I, that's that's like I have to that for, because because my brain is so like insane like I can't I can't handle any more darkness you know so like yeah. I love I really like um, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt um, oh that's great that's she's awesome it's so funny right and and I, and I just and you know like I, I love I could watch Buffy for hours like I love I just I like things that are smart and funny and have a heart you know um i mean I, i'm not saying that i do like dark things too. like i like medium medium is a really cool show i mean it's not on the air anymore but i still like it um well i think all of the episodes are on netflix right now i i love mad men mad men was a great show did you ever get into mad men you know what i didn't i think we uh we watched a couple of episodes but we it didn't hook us and then well in general i'm a late adapter like i've only just started watching game of thrones oh i haven't seen that yet actually i have not seen game of thrones people keep saying that i would like it and i haven't is it good it it's awesome and that's what especially like once i started too many words i would keep talking to guests and uh, game of thrones kept coming up and they're like oh you know you would really like it it's like well and i tried to watch that a couple of times and couldn't get into it and finally i think i'm i'm finishing up the second season and uh yeah it's awesome I'll, I'll i'll give it a shot i think um the women there is so many and i i was really surprised by this i didn't expect it but there is so many kick-ass women characters in that show yeah i like that that's great i mean that's i mean that's like we were talking about that's what i love about buffy is that it's so feminist mm-hmm. you know Totally. Well, and that's one thing. I don't know if you watch the 100 at all. Mm -hmm. Um, That's a, it's pretty, it's a pretty cool show. And the one, there's one character in that um, named Octavia and she does, she she kind of scratches a similar itch that Buffy does, where (laughs) she's just this smart, strong, um, you know, really just kick ass, does what she has to do to make things happen kind of character. Um, and she, yeah, she, she brought me into the show and, and now I'm hooked for various number of reasons, but. Wait, so it's a, the, the 100? Yeah. The first two seasons are on Netflix and then the third season, um, should be coming on Netflix soon. It just kind of ended on regular TV, I think a month, about a month ago. Nice. You gotta check that out. Yeah. It's really, um. As far as like genre wise, I mean, it's it's got some science fiction elements and it's definitely like dystopian as far as it takes place in a, you know, a fictitious future. But it's it's really cool. And the way the characters grow throughout the show is uh, really well done. The, the, the 100. Yep. I mean, and then there is as far as like, you know, there's definitely like, you know, it's an intense show. It's not light. So you guys live, but you, you were at, outside of Seattle? Uh, yeah, so I live um, just a little bit like I'm like nine minutes away from the from the city line. That's awesome. I love I actually it's funny. I'm going to be in Portland. I'm going to be in Portland in like six days. Oh, go. wow. Yeah, no, I, I love it out here. I'm originally from uh, New Jersey. Nice. Yeah, I should come up and say hello. <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, no, I love the Pacific Northwest. It's just it's so, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. I, I really I fell in love with Portland. It's funny because I fell in love with Seattle and I hadn't even, you know, um, ever been. So it's like I was, I grew up in um, northern New Jersey. 
at some point I just made the decision. I was just like, uh, you know, Seattle is for me. That's, that's exactly how I feel about Portland. I'm like, I'm out, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it's, you know, the East coast and, and, and I think New York is really difficult for, for somebody that has anxiety. It oh. really is. I, I find that I, you know, I, I find that I'm consistently exhausted because it is a lot of sensory overwhelmingness. Big time it is over there. Yeah. You know, and like even, you know, Jersey is like that too, to an extent, mm-hmm. certain parts, but I feel like it's just too much. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I, I mean, where I, I grew up, it was over like by like the um, Bergen County Paramus Mall area. So it was super super congested. I mean, not the same as New York City, but still, yeah. It's different. I mean, cuz out here too, you have so much there is so much um like breathtaking nature. So it's like as crazy as, you know, the traffic is around here sometimes. You know, there's also a rocky beach with Olympic Mountains 5 minutes away from me. This is this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, like that's that's what I mean. Like that's that's what I mean about or, that's what I fell in love with about Portland. I'm like this is what's up. You so know? are you coming out to Portland to visit or are you, you planning on uh, moving there? So it's it actually, it's so funny. I'm, I'm going there for two weeks to dog sit for my friend. So random, but you know, <laughs> this is my friend who I've known since the third grade and she's like my homie and um, her dog is totally obsessed with me. So I'm house sitting and dog sitting and, you know, in exchange for being able to basically stay for, for free in Portland, you know, that's awesome. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I'm hoping, hoping that I can migrate out there. That's, that's the plan, but you know, it's gonna, it's, I gotta, there's a lot of research involved in that. Yeah. Well, especially, I know it's moving with, you know, kids is just totally different. I mean, we came out here with, you know, a car and our stuff in garbage bags and we drove out here, you know, we didn't have really anything set up yet. So mm-hmm. as far as like, you know, Moving a family is just different. It takes more planning. I mean, we we stayed in an extended stay hotel before living in a boat. So it's like, you know, it's a little, we were able to be a little bit more. That's cool, though. That's a cool story. Yeah. I'm glad we did that. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, like, you know, I, I'm sure that, have you told your kids about your, your exodus? Yep. Um, it could be a fun story. Yeah, it feels that way. And we, uh, and we got married. Uh, we kind of, uh, we were engaged at the time, but we got married out, out here and we eloped and we didn't have any family with us. And the, our witnesses were our, um, our boat landlord and his uh, girlfriend. So it was, it's, it's cool to have that, especially now that we're, you know, we're more, we're way, I mean, I don't know if we're like, you know, there's lots of people who are probably even more settled, but we're way more settled now than we were. And it's, it's cool to kind of look at that and be like, oh, glad we did that. <laughs> yeah, that, it's cool, for sure. Well, that's cool that you're uh, coming coming out uh, to Portland. I'm excited. I really love how beautiful Portland is. I, lo- I, I love Cannon Beach. I, I mean, I, it was it was ridiculous. It was just ridiculous. Like everywhere I wanted to stop and take a picture. Like I was telling my friend Amanda, when I went there, I'm like, can we stop and take a picture of this? Oh my God. It's so beautiful. <laughs> like everything. Everything is amazing. Yeah. Uh, could you tell uh, everybody where they can, uh, they can find you on Twitter and your site and your writings and that kind of stuff? Yes. So on Twitter, I am at the Sarah Fader and you can find me so my blog is oldschoolnewschoolmom.com and you can find out like how to contact me for any kind of public speaking engagements at sarahfader.com. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. So much fun. I, I will let you know when I'm in Portland, maybe I'll take a drive up with the kids to Seattle. That's not so far, right? I think it's about four hours. That's not too bad. It was really amazing to talk to you. Thank you so much. Oh, definitely. It was great talking to you. All right, guys. Well, that wraps it up for now. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Be sure to check out Sarah Fader's site. Follow her on Twitter. Give her some love. Tell her you listen to her on the show. You can follow me on Twitter at me, Bettingfield. Follow the show for updates on episodes and upcoming guests at Too Many Words Pod. 
Go to iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, leave a review. Let me know what you think. Encourage other listeners to tune in. And of course, you can find all my good stuff in one neat place, jamiebeddingfield.com. Until next time. <laughs>